to give a special shout out to one of my partners in the Gospels in the room with me, uh, Pastor Lucius, who pastors a church called You Movement um, in Marietta, a little bit north of our gathering. If you're watching me right now, anywhere in the city of Atlanta, and you live in the Marietta area, you don't need to drive down here. Um, there is a church that we have supported and helped plant in the Marietta area called You Movement Church. It is. <clears throat> and if you live in that area of Atlanta and you're looking for a church where the gospel's being preached, an end time church where the spirit of God is, you don't need to drive down here. You can go to You Movement Church in Marietta, Georgia. Um, pass it by my brother Lucius. I love you, brother. Thank you. Um, for all your praise and support it means a lot to me and uh, I want to try to do something different today just a little bit I want to attempt to not talk long because I feel like I feel like we need to have a moment of prayer before we leave this room together And I want to ask everybody, especially those of you in the risers, and when I'm done talking, I know there's a tendency for us to get to the lobby first or get to our cars first. But I feel like the gravity of this particular text, the gravity of what the Lord has said to us in the text is so serious. I feel like the Holy Spirit told me we can't leave the room without a moment of corporate prayer. Like, we need to come together and pray. <clears throat> so if you are guests, brother and sister, we welcome you to 2819. And if you are watching us online, we welcome our... Our online family all across the city of Atlanta, all across this country, and a few pockets around the world eventually will become our global family. And if you are not a follower of Jesus, you are an unbeliever, you're still exploring the claims of Christ, you're an atheist or an agnostic, we know you're in the room, and we acknowledge you and we're glad that you're here. Um, This is a place where you could belong before you believe. And you could keep coming while you are trying to figure out, uh, is the claims of Christ real? No judgment zone. You are entitled to keep coming here even if you don't believe what we believe. I know you're in the room and we're just glad that you're in the room. <clears throat> We are starting today a brand new series called Kingdom Callings. And uh, this is a series through the back half of Matthew chapter 9, all of Matthew chapter 10 to the back half of Matthew chapter 11. And if you are not a follower of Jesus, we don't want you to be confused about that. We are walking through line by line, verse by verse, a book that has been preserved for us in the New Testament of the scriptures called Matthew. Matthew was a Jewish man who lived in the first century AD who was an outcast Jew, for he was hated because of his career, was seen as treason to his ethnic brothers and sisters. At some point in time in the first century, Matthew had an encounter with Christ Jesus that changed his life. He would go on to follow Christ for the rest of his life. He would go on, according to Fox's Book of Martyrs, to become a martyr. He would give his life for the gospel. And before he died, somewhere in the year A.D. 65, around A.D. 60s, he wrote the book that bears his name called Matthew. The Bible is not a singular book, but it is a library or collection of 66 ancient documents 
This collection of documents, according to all stats, is the most read collection of documents in the history of the world. It is the most purchased collection of documents in the history of the world. And of all these documents, Matthew is the most read document in the Bible, so it is the most read document in the history of the world. According to church history, for some 1,700 years, the early church, those who were brothers and sisters before us, used the book of Matthew as their go-to document to build up the church in discipleship for 1,700 years. And so we are walking through this ancient document that is the most read document in the history of the world. And for me personally, as a student of the scriptures and as the one with the microphone, this document has been wrecking my soul. Today, I'm going to be fully transparent, right? Like, I pray hard, and I study hard, and I prepare hard, and I work hard. Today, this moment is very difficult for me. I've had a very difficult preparation week. Like, and, and not because of, not because that I'm lazy, I'm, I'm very studious when it comes to the word, but a difficult preparation week because the words of Christ that we're about to approach was so heavy to me. And Elder Eric and I was talking about this, that in my prayer time, it was like I just wanted to go and be with Christ. And, and I was just longing to see his face. I, would, I was laid out on the floor in my prayer room and stretched out feeling like I was holding on to his ankles in my mind and, and, and not wanting to leave his presence for, for long periods of time. I could barely get up to work on a sermon. I could barely get to my computer to work on notes because, because just as I, as I just think about the gravity of this text, my heart is overwhelmed. I read it was also Charles Spurgeon, the prince of preachers from England, who said it was this text above all others in the New Testament that troubled him the most. And, 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 and my, my concern is, is that as we walk through this text, so small, so short, only four verses, a very small corpus, that there's not, there's not going to be no shouts today. Nobody's going to be shouting me down with amens because, because I feel like as we walk the text, I, I feel like there's going to be a weight of conviction that settles on the room. And I feel like we can't leave here until we pray together about our failure. You hear that word? Failure to these words of Christ. Let me repeat. Our failure to these words of Christ. And so for all my note takers, Matthew 9, 35 through 38 is what we're going to study today. And we're going we're gonna to tag a title to the text that just represents your sphere of influence, your home, your family, your calling. Your gym, your fill in the blank. The first word of the title are those circles for you. The second word of the title is where I feel like we're failing, but I want us to change in that area. So we're not fancy here. We just pull titles from the, from the scriptures. Matthew 9, 35 through 38, we're just going to call it feels and faithfulness. My first feel is my home. It's going to make sense to you by the end. And then everything outside of my house, where the Lord has put my feet, or watch, given me influence. Now, this is a heavy text. The outline in my heart is real sketchy. And I'm going to talk to you, I'm going to attempt to talk to you for just a short period of time. Listen to me. We need to repent and pray. I know y'all love entertainment because we Americans. Listen to me. 
By the time I finish talking to you about these four verses, we need to stay here for a moment. We need to probably get on our knees and we need to repent and pray. Spirit of the living God. My heart is so broken and so grieved. Lord, for the glory of your name, would you help me in my weakness some way, somehow, communicate your heart to these who call you Savior? Some of us with lifestyles that don't match that profession. Jesus, would you subdue every demonic force that will attempt to rob us of the revelation of this word would you drive out every stronghold from our minds of faulty beliefs and thought patterns would you cause a spirit of repentance and conviction and urgency to settle upon these, my brothers and sisters. And with the weight of your words come to bear on the foolishness of our hearts. In the times that we live, I plead with you, Lord, in the mighty and majestic, look up those words, and the matchless name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Everyone who at least agrees with me, would you say amen? Amen. Family, on Friday night, I was downstairs in the basement in my home office. And I was down there with my wife and my daughter Israel and my son Josiah. And my wife and Israel got up from the couch and they went upstairs. And it was Josiah and I alone in the room. He's 11 years old. I was putting together like a coffee table or something that my wife had just bought for me. And Josiah asked me, he began to ask me all of these eschatological questions. End time questions. Eschatological, end times questions. And he said to me, he said, Daddy, who is the Antichrist? And with no prompting from me, we wasn't talking about the scriptures. We wasn't watching things. We don't have TVs in our house except for one room in the living room. So there's no TV on. There's no conversation about the Bible. I'm not preaching to my family every minute of every day. We're just sitting there having a, a, a time together. We're listening to jazz music. I don't even have on worship. And, and, and with no prompting, he asked me, Daddy, who is the Antichrist? And I said to him, I said, why do you want to know? He says, because I want you to tell me, who is the Antichrist? And, and I said to him, I said, Josiah, the Antichrist is a man who the scriptures prophesy about that he's going to rise one day to political power. And according to the scriptures, he's going to sign a seven-year peace treaty with Israel. And according to the scriptures, he's going to rule the world politically for about seven years. And according to the scriptures, he will be an evil man, blasphemous, and he will declare himself to be God. And then he said, well, what kind of things will he say? And I said, well, he would declare that he himself is the Lord and that he is divine. 
And he will probably be handsome. He will probably be a smooth politician. He might even go against the traditional marriage at the rate the generation is going. Y'all miss that. Watch. I won't be surprised if he's married to a man. Watch. And then he said, well, well, well daddy, what's going to happen when he comes to power? What's going to happen to the people when he comes to power? He said, he will, he will deceive all human beings according to the scriptures. And he will have great power from Satan according to the scriptures. And he said, well, what's that seven-year period called? I'm like, it's called the tribulation period. He said, what's going to happen during the tribulation? I'm like, I'm like the scripture says during the tribulation there will be seven years of pain and hardship and war and death and famine. And except God shortened that period to seven years, he said all human beings would die because of the suffering during that time. There will be a lack of food, a lack of water, I told him, and that everybody who will buy and sell must take a mark in their hand or in their right hand on their forehead. And except you take that mark, which is called the mark of the beast, I told him, you cannot buy or sell. So if anybody, I told them, gets saved during those days and they reject the mark, they will live like nomads out in the street. It will be hard to be a Christian in those days. Y'all ain't seen nothing yet. He said, well, what about all of us and what about the church? And, and, and is, when is the rapture going to happen, Daddy? I said, Joey... The, the rapture, Paul talked about it, the day is coming when we're going to be caught up to meet Christ in the air from the sound of a trumpet and the dead will rise first and we will be with Christ. And I told him that the tribulation is going to be a catching away. When Jesus said in Matthew 24, a husband and wife will be laying in the bed, one will be taken and the other will be left in the bed. Two people will be at work during nine to five. One will be taken and the other will stay until five o'clock. Two people will be driving down the highway. One will be taken and the other is going to be left and they will enter into the tribulation period when the church has been removed from the earth. And then he said to me, well, what's going to happen when the tribulation is over? I said, Joey, the, the Lord will come and, and, and set off what's called the millennial reign. He said, how long is that going to last? I said, according to the scriptures, a thousand years. He said, well, where's the devil going to be during that time? I'm like, he's going to be bound up according to the scriptures. And what would the world be like during those thousand years? This is a true story. And I'm like, according to the scriptures, there will be world peace. He said, peace for a thousand years? I said, yes, Joey, peace. For a thousand years. And then what happens after that? I said, well, the scripture says then the devil is released for one more battle in which he will be destroyed and then all evil will be tossed into the lake that burns with fire. It's a true story. And he says to me, well, what happens to everybody who wasn't in Jesus? said, well, according to the scriptures, they're going to be separated from God for all eternity. He said, so wait, so everybody's going to live forever? I said, yeah. He said, but what about when we die? I said, I said, Joey, you remember in the scriptures when it said that God created man in his own image and in his own likeness? That we were created in the likeness of God? God is an eternal being, I told Joey. And so he made all human beings eternal beings. And that death is only a transition into eternity. And I told him that nobody disappears or evaporates. Everybody either goes to eternal damnation or eternal glory, is what I told him. He said, for real? I said, so your papa, your granddad, who's he's in eternal glory, I told him. And people who die separated from God, they are eternally separated. And I said, there's no changing over wherever you end up, I said to him. He said, well, does the scripture say all of that? And I open up to Revelation 21. 
And I read to him where Jesus says, behold, I'm going to make all things new. And I told Joey about the eternal state. And he says, so what is the world going to be like? I said, there'll be new trees and new bodies of water and colors we've never seen before and food we've never tasted. And I said to him that Jesus, according to the scriptures, is going to reign and rule from the city of Jerusalem bodily. And that God is going to make his abode with men in the new earth. That we're not going to be floating on clouds forever. That heaven is temporary. And I told him that God is going to recreate the earth after he destroys it with fire. And we're going to be in a new earth with new water and new trees and new food and new colors. And I read to him where it says there'll be no more tears and no more pain and no more frustration and no more suffering and no more sorrow and no more death no more back issues and no more aging no more funerals a life of bliss with no drama no betrayals no backstabbing no sin nobody scheming on me no trolls on my social media page And then he said, Daddy, I feel like I'm agitating you. <laughs> and I said, no, it's okay, go ahead. He said, no, that's all I want to know. <laughs> Kid is smart. I went to bed on Friday night thinking about all them questions Joey asked me. And as I was laying in my, as I was laying in my bed, I was thinking to myself as I laid in my bed, I thought to myself like, Who is this going to affect? I thought about everything Joey asked me, and I asked myself as I laid in my bed, man, who is this going to affect? And I thought to myself, all of this he asked me is written in the scriptures, like it's not even hidden from humanity. And I thought to myself how the Lord put it in the scriptures when John was on the island of Patmos because he wanted everybody to know it. And I thought to myself, he wanted us to see what was going to happen in the end with the hopes it would affect how we think and move now. And I thought to myself, as I wrestled with Joey's questions, man, like, who is this going to affect? I started thinking about family members who are not in Christ. I started thinking about people I go to the gym with who are not in Christ. I started thinking about friends who I love who are not in Christ. Man, I started thinking about all the people I know and love who are doing their thing. When any day I could get that phone call, this person died in a car crash. And I know, man, they were not in Christ. Man, and I'm laying in my bed on Friday night and I'm wrestling with these questions and I'm wrestling with this text. And then I start thinking to myself, it's like I start going on this tweeting like X, whatever the heck they want to call it now, so stupid X. I start tweeting like my heart and I'm like, Lord, what are we doing? No, I'm asking y'all seriously, what are we really doing? Like, why are you here? Why do we do this every single Sunday and there's nothing happening in your heart during the week? Like, what is this? Are you here just to hear me talk? Am, am I an entertainer to you? Do you just want to be here to hear me tickle something in your soul? Like, are we gathering to just show off our outfit or your dope J's? Or you want somebody to see that your outfit is dope? Like, what is the purpose for us being here? 
And I start thinking about the church, man. The stuff I be seeing on social media, these stupid reels I be seeing, like, like what are we talking about in our generation? What are we preaching about? You got all these people who think they sages. They think they smart and they think they wise, spewing off all this stuff with God's name attached to it. No scripture to back that up. And I'm thinking about all the nonsense I see online. All the foolishness I'm seeing preached in America. I'm thinking about all of this and my heart is broken. I'm thinking about all the people who are lost and my heart is broken. And I lay there with tears streaming down my eyes just crying out to God for some type of spiritual revival in this nation. I mean, we do a lot of church, but man, we are so disconnected from the Christ of Christianity. Family, listen to me. I don't, know, I don't know how to get this in your heart, but this grief I feel, I feel like a lot of us do church have never felt that grief. A lot of us call ourselves Christians have never felt that grief. And you think it's just for me, the pastor. And it is this kind of frustration, watch, that's at the epicenter, these adverse sentiments. It's at, the, it's at the core of the very passage we're supposed to be studying today. These heavy words of Jesus to his followers. So let's get context around the text. Matthew records the birth of Christ, the rise of Christ, the ministry of Christ in Galilee, where I've been and where I will be in January. And in Matthew, word, shout out, right? To, shout out Dr. Kenneth Bruce. And Matthew records the explosion of Jesus' ministry in Galilee. And in Matthew 4.23, he talks about Jesus went all throughout Galilee, preaching and teaching and healing in the synagogues. And then he goes from a synopsis of the ministry in 4.23. And then he gives us a broader picture of that synopsis when he gives us the teaching of the Sermon on the Mount, Kingdom Gems. And then he gives us all of this list of powerful miracles, God of miracles, to show that Jesus was the Messiah. And after he gives us the Sermon on the Mount and the list of all these miracles, he comes to another synopsis of Jesus' ministry. And what happens during the time of that synopsis, Matthew was there when Jesus said it. We need to repent for this. Matthew chapter 9 and verse 35. Matthew records this. He says, and Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. Stop. So Matthew gives us another synopsis of the ministry of Jesus. He says, Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. So I want you to see where Jesus went. He's telling us that the ministry of Jesus began to expand and it began to explode now beyond Galilee into all of the major cities. This is so powerful. And all of these small villages. Now watch. He mentions cities and villages, so he tells us that Jesus now is traveling to places, big, urban, metropolitan places where wealthy and well-to-do people lived, and there he preached the gospel and taught them. Then he travels to small, obscure villages where poor people lived, and, and there he preached the gospel and taught them. Jesus so wise now modeling for his disciples that the gospel is for all people. That the message of hope in Jesus Christ is not just for those of a certain socioeconomic status. 
Now, this is important because in our culture, we preach the gospel wrong. We always say foolishness like, try Jesus. Like he's a Kirby vacuum cleaner that I'm trying to pitch to you at a front door. Or we think the gospel is only for the middle class and people who are poor and on food stamps. So we say stuff like, try Jesus because he'll make your life better. And so we pitch Jesus as a genie to a better life. When the gospel is not about materialism or socioeconomic status, the message of Christ is a message of righteousness. So nobody will say amen to that. It don't got nothing to do with socioeconomic status. The message of the gospel went to cities and villages. The Lord modeling my message is for all human beings. See, but when you keep talking that garbage about try Jesus and, oh, he's going to make your life better. And if you come to him, you might get the car you want. And the house, you pitching that to who? To people in apartments that can't afford houses? People on martyr who can't get a bus? Like, who are you trying to manipulate with that message? Try to convince a multimillionaire that they need to try Jesus. They balling? They got houses and cribs? What I need your God for? See? And that's they thought because you preach the gospel wrong. The gospel is about righteousness. Why? Because all human beings need that. You want the evidence? There are poor people in damnation. And they are wealthy people in damnation. Jesus even told a story about a wealthy man that went to damnation and did not know the place was real, cried out for water, could not get water. Please go tell my brothers this place is real. No, they have the prophets, the real ones. And if they don't listen to the voice of the real prophets, they're going to end up in the same place where you are. And so the gospel is about righteousness. You know what that is? We all was already born hell-bound. And upon the cross where Christ died, he imputes to the human being righteousness or right standing in the eyes of God who is supremely holy and will punish all sin if you die in it. That when people say it's not fair for God to create a hell, he never created it for human beings. The scripture says, created it for Satan and demons. But because people reject Christ, they're going to share apartments in hell with Satan. I always remind our church every few months that Judas is there and have been there for the first century. Do the math, not getting out. And that in the gospel, when a person is drawn to the Father through Christ, Christ applies righteousness to that person's soul so that when God sees that human being, he no longer sees them as guilty because of sin. He sees them as righteous in his sight. A powerful word called justification. Justify, it's a judicious word to mean, although you were guilty, the Lord took that wrath upon himself for you in the courtroom, he walked in, pushed you to the side, says, you leave the courtroom, I'm gonna stay here and pay this price. And some of you think that's a game, unless you've been in legal trouble like me, been locked up multiple times, stood in front of judges multiple times. It's a terrifying thing to stand before a man that has your future in his hands. And then you stand there in an orange jumpsuit, hoping for mercy. I know that personally. And that you can't do anything when that gavel slam. You can argue and fight and spit at the bailiff. They're still going to drag you to where your sentence is. Well, screw Jesus and F Christ and all this stuff. You're not going to be that tough when you die. Give me that camera. All that blasphemy you spitting. You're not going to be that tough when you die. That's why the Bible says, in the day you hear the call of the gospel, harden not your heart. 
For the writer of Hebrews said, it's appointed for man to live one time. And then he must stand judgment. Ain't nobody bringing you to the conference to hear this message. Because it don't itch the flesh, but it stirs up something in the soul. It makes a wretched man says, I need God. So stop trying to manipulate people into the faith by promising them things you can't give them. You can't promise them they're going to get everything they want. You can't promise them Jesus is going to give them a new house. You can't even promise them they won't suffer. Paul, Paul, that man, I want him. Watch, I call Paul and see how much he will suffer for my name's sake. How about that for calling? How about that for your American Christianity? Your best life is your next one. I don't have a mic, but if I... How about that? How about that for American Christianity? Your best life will be your next one. There is, there is no utopia you're going to create here that's going to be greater than eternity. Let, let, me, let me repeat that. You can, you can grind till you're blue in the face and hustle until your fingers fall off. There's no utopia you're going to create down here that's going to be greater than what the Lord has prepared for those of us who have placed our faith in him. For no eye has seen and no ear has heard what the Lord has prepared for those of us who are in Christ. And I believe as a theologian or urban one that eternity is going to be so dope that we only get glimpses of it in the scriptures that the Lord refused to give us the whole picture because he wants you to take it by faith. If you know everything from A to Z, you don't need faith. That's why sometimes he leaves you in a fog on purpose. He'll tell you, take that step, and you have no idea what's going to happen when you do that. Because if you had all the answers, you wouldn't need faith. My wife and I came here with nothing but the clothes on our back. With no knowledge of what's going to happen next. So who is the gospel for? Everybody. And it's a gospel of righteousness. Not ratchetness. That part. Righteousness. So what is Jesus doing right here as he's traveling and teaching and preaching? Watch. He's modeling for his disciples. You take this gospel, we'll get to that in the back half of Matthew, to the very ends. That's not exciting because watch, it's not about you. See, you're so American. You don't get excited when I say take the gospels to the end because you think, well, how does that benefit me? See, watch, we're going to have to repent when this is over. Watch. Now watch. I only got three more verses. I know it's hot. That's why we need our own facility. That's why I want all of y'all to be faithful in your giving. We're trying to stack this $5 million. 
the bank don't care about my prayers. And if you think it's hot, you don't want to go to hell. This is nothing compared to where the lost are. I got three verses. Can I, can I finish them? So Jesus is traveling through where? Cities? Watch. Why, why watch? Villages? And he's watch. He's teaching where? In their synagogues, right? This is so powerful. He's in their synagogues. Where? He's in the place where they gather, where they worship, and where they open up the scriptures and explain them, modeling for his people his respect for sacred gatherings. Well, I don't need the church, and I don't need a gathering. I don't need. Jesus is preaching in synagogues, showing his respect for sacred gatherings where it's designed for worship, for instruction in the scriptures. God. That's where he is, modeling. Modeling. For all of us who treat this as common and ordinary who take this for granted. He's in rooms like this, watch, teaching. Notice it and say he was in rooms like this entertaining. My American brothers and sisters, who you love to jump off of the platform and run around the church when people are saying nothing. Accents with heresy. Degrees with heresy. And they talk well with heresy. And the reason you don't know that is because you don't have enough word in you to discern lies. So if it sounds good, it must be right. And I don't have enough Romans in me to hear, that's not the gospel. I don't have enough Galatians in me to hear, I can wear earrings and pants. They, they, I don't have enough Corinthians in me to know I should not be wiling out in the church. Should not get that. I don't have enough Ephesians in me to say I should not be racist. You're so pro-black that you're anti-white. Not enough Ephesians. You're so white that you're anti-black. Not enough Ephesians. I don't have enough Thessalonians in me to not be lazy. They don't get this. I don't have enough Colossians in me to see that Christ was more than a prophet. I can walk you through the whole book. I don't have enough Exodus in me to know it was Jesus who brought them out of Egypt. That's what the scripture says in the New Testament. showing people from thousands of years ago that I am a deliverer. Not enough Bible in you to know they lying. All right, three verses. Three verses. The heat makes me tired. I know I'm not the only one in here who feels tired. I rebuke the spirit of weariness in the room. I come against weariness in the room. I pray a spirit of hunger in you. If you say it's hot, but I'm going to lean forward for this gospel. Three verses. He's traveling. He's preaching, he's teaching, and now here's where it's about to get heavy. Matthew 9, verse 36. I'm about to put the American church in these next three verses. Watch us. Matthew wrote, when Jesus, he, saw the crowds, the people, the gatherings, when he saw social media, he had compassion.
before them because they were harassed, demonic, helpless, like sheep, stupid creatures without a shepherd. No. Let, let's unpack this. Give me a few minutes here. Watch. It says he traveled. Everybody watch this. Jesus is traveling through cities. He's doing conferences. He's blowing up in Atlanta and in New York and in Chicago. He's out to L.A. and back down to Miami. He's running through Birmingham. And he's all over the country preaching. Conferences are packed out. Places are packed out. He sees people out in the streets trying to get into the room, and he stops and he looks at the crowds of people that's following. He looks out on the crowds, and the scripture says, Matthew says, he saw. Watch, everybody watch, because this is where we're going to repent, because a lot of you don't see. <laughs> you got eyes, but you are blind. I'm telling you right now what I know. I know by the spirit, by the way that you live, the way that you do church, the way you see Christianity, you are blind. Jesus saw. You know what that means? Here's a man who saw lost humanity and was grieved over that. Here's a man who was self-aware about what was going on around him and was grieved about that. Here is a man who was looking out at the people and seeing their condition spiritually and he was grieved about that. Here's a man seeing mothers and fathers, husbands and wives, homes disconnected from Christ. Families disconnected from Christ. Friends disconnected from Christ. Gym buddies disconnected from Christ. Here is the Lord looking out over humanity and his heart is watch broken over the spiritual condition of the people. This is the heart of the person who who's at work and sees the people at their job who are lost and feels sorry for them. This is the heart of the people, man, who are in the gym getting fit with people all around you, knowing that if you got a phone call later and you feel sorry for them. This is the heart of those of us who are moving through Atlanta and looking out over our city and seeing people who are far away from God and feeling grieved over them. This is us being on social media and see people talking against God, not knowing they're headed for judgment and being grieved and feeling sorry over them. This is us not just thumbing through with our fingers and going past all this nonsense and not feeling our heart, Lord God, do something about the state of the church and the state of the world in my country. This is the heart of people who see, watch, the depravity of human beings, the brokenness in our society, the ills of the damage of sin, and something on the inside of you is moved with a deep sense of grief, watch over the condition of human beings. Some of us, you don't even feel that because you are blind. You've never prayed for the loss. You've never shed a tear over the condition of society. You don't even care that all of your activities around people who are going to hell and you could care less about their souls. Here is a man who was self-aware, watch, but not self-absorbed. That I feel like for us, watch, most of the preaching in our society is a preaching that focuses you on you. So the majority of our preaching, listen to it in America. It's all about self-help and how to get. Everything is about your vision board and what you want. So we see Christianity, watch, as a vehicle to my kingdom and that God exists for my glory and that all of my prayer time is begging him for what I want and that God helped the church if it just depended on your prayers it 
It says he saw, watch, the state of humanity and what happened to his heart. It was moved, watch this, with compassion. You know what that is? He felt sorrow. For what? For the condition of human beings. Watch. Now watch this. I only got two more verses. And then he said, watch. They were, watch this, they were harassed and helpless. Now watch this, everybody. You hear the words harassed and helpless, and then you automatically attach that to poor people. Watch. Watch how we get down. Watch. You read the word harassed and helpless in your mind, you automatically think poor people. But where was he preaching? In city? Study the text. And in villages. So we know that harassed and helpless is not just socioeconomic. You study this in Greek, and what it reads out to really be is, here are people harassed and helpless. Watch. Really means people who have been spiritually neglected. <laughs> it's, what, it's what the original language teaches us, Greek. People who have been, watch, spiritually neglected. Watch. The next question is, by who? By those who was entrusted to teach them. <laughs> watch. It's going to make sense in a second. Pharisees and the scribes, Israel's spiritual leaders, filling the people with lies and man-made doctrines that when the Lord rolls up on them, he sees them. You've been under all that teaching, but your soul is a mess. That's why you better be careful what church you're in. You're under all those voices, but your spiritual condition is a mess. You've been listening to her podcast and his podcast and reading their books, but your spiritual condition is a mess. So he says about these people, y'all, they have been spiritually neglected. Now, let me tell you why I'm... Br I'm so... My kid said I can't use this word. I'm going to use it anyway. I'm so pissed off. Upset. Grieved. Watch. When I see the preaching in our country. And when I, when you just listen, let me ask you a question, you listen to the preaching in this country, what is it preparing you for? It's not preparing you to be ready for the return of Christ. It's not preparing you for what the New Testament prepares us for, to be others-centered and not self-centered. You know what? Thank you, Holy Spirit. I challenge everyone listening to me right now. Here's homework for you. Pick one New Testament letter. Watch this. I want everybody to do this. Just pick one. Pick a short one. Colossians, Ephesians, Galatians, Jude. Pick a short one that you won't get bogged down. I challenge everybody in this room, pick one short New Testament letter, first or second Peter, watch. Sit down for 20 minutes and just read it without stopping. Then come up for air and tell me, does it sound like American preaching? Because you cannot read the New Testament and come away thinking that the gospel is about you and your kingdom and your ambitions and what you want and Jesus is a genie, you can't come away with that. If you read the New Testament, you know what you're gonna come away with? It's a fight to grow you up spiritually and to teach you to live self-sacrificially. And the reason you don't know that is because you don't read. So I challenge everyone in this room don't believe me. Be like the Bereans. Pick one New Testament letter this week. 
By the time we see you next Sunday, you better have read it. If you don't, the Lord rebuke you. Just, I'm just joking. <laughs> the Lord rebuke the hell out of you. If you don't do it, you're disobedient. Your pastor's telling you. Oh, I'm sorry. Some of y'all, I'm not your pastor. I'm just a preacher you like. This preacher is telling you. Pick one, one short New Testament letter. Ephesians, Galatians, Philippians, Colossians, Jude, 1 John, 2 John, 3rd. Just pick one. Don't do Romans too long. Don't do Hebrews too long. Just pick a short one that you can read in 15 minutes. Read it all the way from the beginning to the end. Read for distance, not for depth. We're going to change. Read for distance. Read it to the end and then come up for air and turn on American preaching. Listen to all of the sermon clips on social media. And, and then just log them. Does it sound anything like what you read? And then ask yourself, watch this, when that's done. After you do your assignment, ask yourself, based on what I read and what I've been accustomed to listen to, have I been neglected? About to close, watch. Everybody, look at me. Look right at me. All eyes on me, like Tupac. Look here. Look right here. What is Jesus grieved over? Answer me. The spiritual condition of his people. What is Jesus grieved over? Everybody, watch this. What is Jesus grieved over? One more time. Everybody talk to me. What is Jesus grieved over? And he's modeling, right? What is his answer for that? No. His answer is the next verse. Y'all laughing. We, we teach the Bible. His answer, watch, to culture and crazy presidents watch, and unsafe family and unsafe friends, unsafe people in the gym, and the spiritual con condition of man. What is his answer for all of that? It's the next verse. <laughs> the last two verses. And then we're going to repent. Watch. So, God. Yeah. The last time you was on your knees, it was all about a house, right? I know. And the time before that, and the time before that, and the time before that, and the time before that. He said, Pastor, what about the callings part? I'm about to get to it. Watch. Watch. Verse, everybody watch. Then he said to, verse 37, he said to his, who? God. Not to the pastor. So, so if he was in the room, who would he be talking to? Let, let me repeat. If Christ was, well, he's here in the spirit. If he was physically here, who would he be talking to? Why don't you make it personal? Who would he be talking to? Come on with it. Let's go. I like this brother right here. Then he said to his disciples, somebody said he said to me. The harvest is plentiful. I'm talking to you. But the laborers are few. Y'all doing church, but y'all wasting time. Therefore, watch this word. Pray. How? Earnestly. Earnestly.
earnestly. You know what the word earnestly means? Pray with fire in your belly. <laughs> Y'all be laughing at me because I'm like that. Pray earnestly with fire in your belly. The word earnest means pray with passion. Pray watch like you care. Pray like it's urgent. Pray like, watch this number, 150,000 people die every day. And 4 million every year. Pray like we don't have whole nations sitting in spiritual darkness under the stronghold of false religion. Pray like Sharia law doesn't have people bound under false gods that does not exist. Pray like the whole Middle East ain't bound by a religious stronghold. Pray like you don't have family members that are going to die and be separated from her. Pray like the people you be twerking with in the gym, like they're not going to die and be separated from God. To my darn children, Nobody is coming after you. It's the church. And, and the church only pray. Earnestly. Plead. Beg. Cry. Wail. Come in before the worship and walk the room with the prayer team and cry out for souls to be in the chairs. You don't want to clap because we don't pray like that. It's all about you and your kingdom and your plans and your endeavors. Your whole relationship with God is about your laundry list of what you want to make your name great. That's why I said we got to repent because when you see right, you pray right. Everybody watch. I'm about to get to the calling part. Watch. Pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Now, everybody listen to me carefully. Watch. When Jesus said this, watch. How many people was on the team? Thirteen. Himself and twelve men. Watch. That's not enough to take the gospel to the millions of people that was alive in that day. Everybody watch this. So when he told them pray for laborers, he was talking about numbers. We need, watch, more bodies in gospel ministry. Now everybody watch. That was how long ago? 2,000 years. Now watch. How many people claim to be Christians today? Two billion. Say the number. Two billion. So the cry still goes out today. Hear my heart. I argue with you that it's not only about numbers. It's not about computation. It's about a lack of revelation. Because the American church has done an amputation to the Christ of Christianity. And what we have created is a Christianity that's amputated from the Christ of the Scriptures. No, there's two billion of us in the earth. There's more than enough laborers to get the gospel to the ends of the earth. Watch. But we don't pray about it. We don't give towards it. We don't care about it. We are not laboring for it. We are not faithful in our fields. It could just start with your field, your spheres of influence. Listen, if you can't do anything because you're afraid to talk about Christ in aisle six of Walmart, surely you can pray. Surely you can invite them to 2819. Watch, watch this word. Surely you can do something. Uh, now I'm about to close. Hold on, watch. What about that calling part? Y'all love that word, calling. In the passage we see next week, Jesus calls his followers to themselves and then he sends them into this harvest field. 
but watch. But if you follow the writings of Matthew, what is the order of calling? He calls us to himself first. Watch the essence. Call to the Savior. Then you're called to see. That's why he showed them the harvest. Then you're called to serve. Before any other specified blank, I'm a prophet, I'm a pastor, before, a, be, l, l, before any other specified fill in the blank, your first callings with an S, call to the Savior first. So you can't be more busy about work and you have no personal relationship. So you're called to the Savior first. You're called to Christ first. To adore him, to love him, to walk with him, to talk to him, to be surrendered to him. Then you're called what? To see next, to see the world through the eyes of the kingdom. Once you've been saved, you got to see through the kingdom. Watch. And then you're called to serve. Baseline Christianity. Be involved in the work of the gospel. Pray, serve, give, do something to move the gospel forward. That's on everybody. And then it is the blank. A prophet, pastor, all this other stuff. Because you love to glorify platforms, but we won't do the basics. So you want to skip savior, seeing, and service and go straight to a platform. And, and let me bust your bubble since you don't read. 98 percent of the time you see the word calling in the New Testament and it's not attached to all these specialized things that you keep saying, what you called to do, what you called to do. 98 percent of the time you see the word calling in the New Testament is not attached to all of these fill in the blanks that you got. 98 percent of the time you see the word calling is attached to salvation and the work of the gospel. Those are your primary callings before anything else. So how should we define callings? Put the definition up on the screen for them. This is what a calling is. A calling is God's divine summoning, beckoning to you of people to himself, to his ways, and to his service. That's where calling begins before platforms. To him, to his ways, to his service first. Before all of you are filling the blanks, God called me to and I'm finna to do and all this other stuff. How you, you call to the platform and you don't have a prayer life? You're trying to bypass him. Call to the platform but hate the brothers and sisters. Trying to bypass the church. Somebody ask me for proof, please. Ask me. Ask me, please. Please, just ask me. Say, say, yo, Philip, give me proof, please. Somebody ask me, beg me. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm going to give you proof, sister. Prove it to you. Uh, no, let's do 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians 5, let's do verse... Let's do verse, yeah, yeah. Let's do 2 Corinthians 5, let's do verse 17. Are y'all there? Uh, uh, let's do, uh, nah, that's not it, that's not it. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just, let, give me a second. Let's do, uh, 2 Corinthians, let's do uh, uh, 5, let's do 17. Let's go there. Everybody there? Therefore, I'm closing now. If anyone is in Christ, I'm done. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, 
minister to these people, Sam. He is what? A new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. How much of this? All of this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to who? To himself. Called you to himself. And after he called you to himself, what did he give you after that? The ministry of reconciliation, of helping others. <laughs> so how are you saved and don't care about the loss? He reconciled you to himself and then gave you a ministry to reconcile others. That is Christ. God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And entrusting, you know what that is? Stewardship. Entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are, you are, ambassadors for Christ. God doing everything he can to make his appeal to lost people. Through you. But how can he do that when you don't care about the field of harvest? You don't care about the loss. You don't care about the people at the gym or the people at your job or the people in your family. You don't give a darn. But he's trying to work through you to bring other lost people to himself. The least you can do is pray. Lord, save my unsaved fill in the blank. Save these people at my job. Save these people in my gym. Save these family members. You've been called to Christ first. And then he's gave you a ministry of reconciliation as part of your calling to be involved in the work of reconciling others. So how in God's name does the American church not prioritize? It's not in our hearts. Watch. And how could it be when the preaching don't teach us Christianity? Right here, we're going to repent. I'm calling all of us right now to a moment of personal prayer. Nobody move in this room. I don't care if you got to get on your knees or get in the aisle. We're going to pause right here and re repent because the scriptures and the news are screaming to us that we're living in the last days. And I keep trying to get you to understand that time is running out. And all, all around us, people are dying. And they're being eternally separated from God. And if the church who has been entrusted with the ministry of reconciliation does not care, God help the lost. Close that door. Right there, you're watching me online. You gotta pull over in your car, you're on your knees in the room. First, are you really called to Christ? Search your heart, do you really love him? 
Are you really surrendered to him? Do you think about him in the morning? Do you think about him during the day? Do you think about him in the evening? Do you love him? Do you want to be with him? Do you honor him, treasure him, obey him? Is he really your savior and your Lord? If you call yourself a follower and the Lord is not the apex of your affection, repent right now. If you love your husband more than Christ, if you love your wife more than Christ, if you love your business and your endeavors more than Christ, if there's anything you know you love more than him and you know it, repent right now. If all of your prayers are self-absorbed, and you know it, you're always begging for what you want. You are not praying for the loss. You are not praying about this harvest. You are not praying for the spread of the God. You know that you're not, you don't care about these things, man. Repent right now, repent. You can't call yourself a follower and not care. Ask the Lord to give you his heart. Ask the Lord to give you his eyes. Ask the Lord to give you his burden. Repent. All of us, from the person with the microphone, repent. Repent for all that stuff that's more important to you than the Messiah. Repent. Repent for being full of apathy and indifference. Repent for just doing you and not even caring about the loss around you. Man, repent for that. Repent for having a whack prayer life and ask God to draw you to himself and set your soul on fire. Lord, I want to desire you more than anything else in this life. More than my ministry, more than my platform, more than a big following, more than a house or car. I want to desire you more than my desire for a husband or a wife. I want you more. Repent. Where have you been more concerned about the thing you claim you're called to more than about your personal relationship with Christ? You want that platform more than you want intimacy. You want that platform more than you want intimacy. You love the platform more than Christ. You want your name to be known more than you want his name to be known. Repent. Where have you been unfaithful in your field? Where have you abdicated your responsibility? Where do you know there's some area of your life in your walk with the Lord? You are not faithful. You're in rebellion. You're disobedient. And you're full of pride. You have a hardened heart. You won't pray. You won't give. You won't serve. You're not generous. You don't care. Where do you know you're in rebellion? Repent. Ask God to take out your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Not flesh for sin, flesh as in soft towards him. Repent. I surrender. And lastly, who can you pray for now? that you know is far away from God. Call their names before the Father. We're going to believe today that they're going to be rescued. 
Who do you know in your family, in your circle, in your field, in your sphere of influence? Call their names right now. Who do you need to forgive and let go? I know they hurt you many seasons ago. Let them go. I know they touched you many seasons ago. Let them go. Even pray for the one who inflicted you with evil. How about that? Pray. Pray out of your heart the person you're holding. Ask God to give you the grace for forgiveness. Come on. You can't hold them forever. It's hindering you from moving forward. The blood of Christ is enough to pay for what they did. The blood of Christ is enough to pay for what they did. You need peace. You need to sleep tonight when you get home. Let them go. Now who can you cry out for who's not saved? Surrender. 
Father, I pray over these your sons and daughters who receive our repentance. Throw down a ball of fire upon our souls and open our eyes to see all around us the harvest that is so ripe on social media. And in our fields of influence, let us be your agents of reconciliation through our prayers, through our generosity, through our service. But time is running out, and you are soon to return. Awaken your children. Awaken the church in America. We pray for one more great awakening, God. One more outpouring of your spirit upon this nation. We cry out for real revival. Real spiritual renewal. We want something to change, Lord. We want something to change, Lord. Awaken your agents, God. Awaken. Awaken your agents. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.